So we had a we had a few delays today. Don't ever fly with EasyJet. <laughs> it was the uh, the strangest phone call you'll ever have because you've got a a very nice Canadian fellow talking to a very laid back Northern Ireland fellow. So it was a, a series of I'm really sorry. Oh, don't worry about it. I, I'm sorry it happened. <laughs> uh, don't, it's, it's okay. I, I, I've got it sorted. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, it was a bit of back and forth, but um, we made it all the way over. You're looking forward to. To coming back to uh, Belfast, you've been here before, of course, with the WWE, uh, coming over for Pro Wrestling Ulster New Direction tomorrow. I certainly am, you know, uh, like you mentioned before, I came over with WWE, it was really, really in and out, but at least this time I'm here for three days instead of just one. And uh, I've heard lots of great things about my opponent tomorrow, should be uh, an awesome contest. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm here at least a day early to uh, enjoy Belfast a little bit. And then after that, off to Japan. Yeah. So you're um, coming over. We're going to go through a, a few different things tonight. We've got some questions later on that people have sent in. We've got going to have some questions from the audience as well. Um, but really just want to go back to kind of the whole story, the... We want the stories within the stories, though, here at Pro Wrestling Ulster. We want a little bit more information. So there is the, the obvious, the, the dungeon, and the stuff we can get on YouTube with you and Tyson Kidd, and the, the to and fro stuff on Stampede, which actually I've really, really enjoyed watching over the last couple of weeks. There's been some really entertaining matches. Um, so we go to the Canadian Stampede in your house 16. Um, that's where you come out and celebrate in the ring with the, the, the hearts. Yes. Um, what do you know at that stage? Because you'd already been training for a little bit. Mm -hmm. What did you know at that stage? Because you go straight to your dad and you give him a big hug and there's, there's a genuine joy and celebration on your face. Yeah. Um, but what do you understand about that match? Uh, how are you watching that in the audience? Is it as a fan or is it as mm -hmm. a, a trainee as such? No, I was watching that like as a fan, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I tell you, that was live and in person, that was like the absolute loudest crowd I've ever like been in front of like or been a part of. You like, I couldn't even hear myself think it was that loud, you know what I mean? And just the reaction when, uh, you know, all of the Heart Foundation came out <clears throat> and then with Brett at the very end coming, like, the, it, it just seemed like the crowd was just er like erupting. And uh, it was, you know, it was like, it was an awesome match too. One of the, like, the last gr great times that all the Heart Foundation were together before yeah. everything happened in Montreal. So no, it was, I would say in person, live, that nothing can compare to that atmosphere that night, nothing. It, it feels like a very underrated match because of what happened in Montreal. It never yeah. got the publicity. Obviously, you get that focus on, on Stone Cold Steve Austin and the handcuffs, and that yeah. worked for him. Yeah. But when you go back and you watch... Oh, Calgary night, wanted to kick his ass. <laughs> <laughs> when you're watching it, I was just completely compelled by the actual match itself and the parts where it broke down, how it broke down, the psychology throughout it. Mm -hmm. And you're like, if Montreal hadn't happened, that match would have been played over and over and over again. It was almost perfect, and it would still stand today on any televised wrestling show, that one particular match would mm -hmm. stand strong. Absolutely, the only one thing that that match was missing, unfortunately, would, and the match was great, but is if Shawn Michaels had been healthy and been in that match, like, can you imagine the, him and Brett, like, live in Calgary that night, like, that, that would have topped it all off, but unfortunately that didn't happen, but that was the only thing that I thought was ever missing from the match. So um, going on from that there, then obviously you've got the dungeon, you've got growing up within the, the Hart family and, and wrestling's kind of your norm. So when you say, I want to be a wrestler, or is it you're going to be a wrestler, or this is what we do on a Sunday afternoon? Yeah, kind of all of the above there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I like for as long as I could remember, I always wanted to be in the wrestling business and, and wrestling professionally uh, I you know it was just it was in my blood it was always the thing that I wanted to do I started at a really young age it's you know it's been it's been an awesome being a part of uh, such a great wrestling family as well 
And, you know, I've gotten to travel and see a lot of awesome things in the world thanks to the wrestling business. So it's, it's been really great. So it, to answer your question, all of the above. It just was always kind of not embedded into my DNA, but pretty much. And was it the ethos of, of, of the Hart family to its technique first, then you build on how you look, it's get your wrestling down. There are a few matches out there, and I, I don't want to offend you because you're, sure. you're looking quite large at the moment, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. But you, you're, yeah. you're wearing that extra large hoodie, and you're a little bit skinny. And you start ah, yeah, wearing. yeah. But that's then, funny. Yeah, I, that's funny you remember that. Yep. Uh, then you get the shock factor of, whoa, they can really go. Yeah, yeah. Like, they're really going. And yeah. it's, then you realize, and then you kind of forget about the fact that you're watching young teenagers. And we've had that, like, with, with people in our roster, that's how we started 10 years ago with a, a training school of young kids and they've all grown up together and now we're focusing in on the Europe Hotel, big shows and that obviously happened with you in Stampede and then you get picked up, but um, at what, what point did you say, hey, right, now it's time to hit the weights and, and or was that, was it a plan, was it planned to end because you had so many people around you that could guide you, was it always, was your development in wrestling always planned? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to put it that way, and just starting from the bottom, training in the dungeon, you really learn the basics well. And that was something that my uncle Bruce and Ross, I think were the best at is teaching people how to the basics. And that's the basics of how to bump properly. And I mean, when you learn how to bump properly down in the dungeon, because that mat is unforgiving, it's a really, really dirty mat. It's you get raspberries and stuff like that. So you really learn how to bump properly to protect yourself. So when you get into other, like a, an actual nice resting ring, you go, oh, geez, this is a walk in the park compared to, you know, learning. But that's the thing is learning how to fall right, learning how to get up, like even learning how to stand up from the bottom properly and stuff like that. Um, so that was learning the basics was the best from training in the dungeon. Then after that, I would say when I was about 17 or 18, I started taking uh, weight training and stuff like that more seriously because at that, like prior to that, I was really busy in high school with amateur wrestling, with trying to keep up with studies. I even dabbled in a little bit of rugby, but that didn't, I didn't really catch on to that too well. Uh, so I'd say about 18 or so was when I started training with Tokyo Joe up in Calgary. And then uh, he was getting me ready for my first tour in New Japan. And then I debuted uh, January 2005, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Did you just fall in love with Japan straight away then because? Yeah, you know, um, prior to that, I, I was always interested in Japan because, you know, my father and Dynamite Kid, they were huge stars over there. And at that time, I would get like, uh, the Japanese office would send Tokyo Joe, the Jap like Japanese wrestling magazines and stuff like that. And then I started getting interested like with Pro Wrestling Noah, because <clears throat> at that time they were like super, super hot. Like they, they were the, the company. Now unfortunately they're not the company. They, you know, they, after Mizawa died and stuff. So uh, I started getting really interested in it from the training with Joe. And then he's, uh, New Japan had sent up Hiroshi Tenzan in the summer of 2003 to train for before the G1 Climax, which he won against the Juna Akiyama. And then I trained during that summer because I was off for school, right, for two weeks. And man, I mean, the training that Tokyo Joe put Tenzan through was pretty serious. For, and it was two weeks straight, no days off. And it was, and then after I knew that I could do that, I figured, okay, I can handle the training to go to Japan. But with Tokyo Joe, even though my father was who he was and stuff like that, I had no shortcuts with him. He made me do all the training, all the hard work and stuff like that. So it was good for me in a way also like that because you get to appreciate things more and also just the being able to go through mentally that hard, hard training like that. It makes you much stronger in the end. And then also just the, the different techniques and just to push yourself past that point sometimes when you're past the point of fatigue, past the point of being tired and stuff like that. And then that's how you build character. And that initial Japanese experience, then you've just held on to that 
throughout your training, whether you've gone into the MMA stuff or wherever you've gone, it's it seems to have always just that ethos is now instilled in you. You run with it. Um, w when you're running camps, do you ever run camps or do you ever take training seminars or anything like that at the moment? Do you are, are you meaning me teaching them? Yeah, you teaching it. Yeah, moment? you know what? I've done a little bit. Uh, like before the shows, like if the promoter would ask me to do a two-hour seminar with the guys, I've done those. I've done a couple little catch wrestling seminars um, in, in Calgary where I live, and then uh, I think it was up in North Dakota. My friend brought me up, and I, I have to say, and hopefully that it was sincere and honest, but everybody always appreciated it and told me that they learned a lot and uh, they took away a lot. So I I, I enjoy teaching. I think I have a good level of patience for teaching. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've learned from <clears throat> guys like Billy Robinson, you know, Tokyo Joe, uh, Josh Barnett. Uh, I mean, training the dungeon and stuff like that. So not to toot my own horn or anything like that, but I would say that my technique is, is proper and is good. And you will at least learn a couple things that will stick with you. And it, it is a lot of information sometimes in a two-hour seminar, but... As long as you get two or three things that you can go forward with, then, you know, I've done my job good, so. Do you find teaching or do you, reflecting on it, do you find all of a sudden, like, halfway through a class, you're saying something out loud to somebody and it's, that memory goes back to, oh, that's, that's who taught me that, that took you with Joe that day, said that oh, to yeah, me. Oh, yeah, for sure. And yep, yep. Do, you, do you think that helps carry on? Uh, or help you carry on then, you know, understand you're constantly bringing up those, those experiences, what you've learned from, what you have learned. So when you're passing it on, do you find yourself reflecting on, on what you actually know? Absolutely, yeah. I, and, you know, mostly pro wrestling wise, I will I'll sh pass on whatever, you know, knowledge that's been passed on to me. As far as like shooting wise goes, I'll, I'll pass on lots of knowledge, but there's a few tricks that I'll show, but I won't explain <laughs> how it's done because yeah, I don't want it done to me someday, you know, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Hey. Yep. That's cool. So we're just, um, I'm going to go to a first question. Now we're going to split this up. I'm going to talk. Obviously, it's not always interesting to hear me talk. I talk a lot. <laughs> they know this. You'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> um, Connor sent us in a question. Sure. Um, uh, what was it like to grow up around wrestling legends? I'm sure it's the norm, but did you ever wonder what it was like on the other side? So what was it like growing up like? Because obviously for you, around the hard family, mm -hmm. it's, it's the total norm. What was it like looking over at the accountant uh, and their kids and they didn't do the whole wrestling thing? Or Oh, I see. Um, well, I guess the one way to put it is like, Everybody thinks, <laughs> growing up, everybody thinks, oh, my dad's the strongest guy in the world because he can pick me up. But I kind of knew, oh, my dad is one of the strongest guys in the world. You know what I mean? So not that I would get in arguments with kids about that, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to argue that one. So Yeah, kind of stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, so you were just, you're just the hard family in Calgary. And exactly. walking down the street, everybody understands you're the hard family in Calgary and much, yeah. that's it ready to go and is I'm right 32 cousins is that, is uh, that, is that well the right uh, there's I think there's well there's there's close to 30 in the Hart family but then I have some over here in the UK yeah so I I don't know exactly what the number is in the Hart family but it's close to 30 yeah it's close to 30 so that it must be an experience growing up. Uh, certainly for dinners. Yeah. Yeah, beating the crap out yeah. of each other. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> the family gets a little crazy too, but you know, all good. It's good. So, and then we've got another question here from, uh, from Richard. Genetically, you come from one of the finest pedigrees that wrestling has ever produced. Any time have you ever felt the pressure to live up to the family name? Yeah, certainly. That's a good question. I mean, there's always been that pressure, but it's always been good pressure for me to uh, try and do my best always, you know what I mean? And and that's never, like, uh, I don't ever feel like I've ever failed in that department because I've always given it 100%. And that's with everybody. As long as you can look at yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, you know, I gave my best, I did 100%, 
there's there's no there's never any shame in that like uh i guess the way hicks and gracie explain it is uh sometimes you cannot win you won't always win but that has nothing to do with losing you know what i mean so yeah. as long as you can look at yourself honestly in the mirror and and say and and be proud of your 100% um <clears throat> effort there's no shame in that so I've, I've felt pressure, but I've always felt like it's pushed me to want to do more. And then even when I'm doing good, I want to keep going up. So yeah. it's never been a bad thing. Can you relate that to a family business of, like, say, carpenters? Is there the same? Although it's in the public it, eye, it, is it the same as, like, say, well, this son's going to have to take on the family business and... and you still, like you taking on the family. Meeting. Yeah, it's a little different with say something like a carpenter, you know what I mean? But a little bit, a little bit in the same, you know, sense. It, it yes or no? It's it, it's it's hard to balance it. Yeah, yeah. no problem at all. So I want to talk. Uh, you went to Japan. You came back from Japan. You were, you were college first of all. Then what did you did you graduate? College? No, well, no, I was I was. Uh, <clears throat> I was certainly good enough to go and stuff like that, but I ended up spending the next like six months after I had left to, uh, high school to train really hard, really, really hard with Tokyo Joe. I mean, that training, we would start at like eight, nine in the morning, and we would run till about one o'clock in the afternoon or so. And we, he wouldn't let you eat anything beforehand because his training was so intense. If you did eat anything, it would be, you would throw it right up. So, uh, I decided to spend and dedicate myself to doing that, and then before going to, to Japan was doing that training for six months. And then you're in Japan. Yes. You come back. And, and actually, I, I'll say this. I, uh, unfortunately, on my first trip to Japan, I broke my hand here, and that, uh, it sucked. You know, yeah, it was, I was on a good roll, good momentum. I was in some high-profile Matches being, uh, geez, I was only 18 at th or 19 at the time. And uh, I was teaming up with uh, Masahiro Chono. I was in Black New Japan. I was the only foreigner on that first tour. It was going really good. And then one night we were in kind of an arena like this where it was really cold. And uh, an I arena. blocked a kick <laughs> with my hand and I broke my hand. And I, Not to say that it didn't. I still went and did two more tours that year, but it just... You, I took three or four months off, and it just slowed. It just I wasn't able to catch that same momentum again. So, and then you're having to build back muscle memory, and, and yeah, it was just it was just the storyline too. And then, because, and then at that time, New Japan was kind of going through a weird time, <clears throat> and then I think Chono's group ended up kind of breaking apart and stuff. So, had it not happened, I think things might have gone different. I might have stayed in Japan for. Year, a couple years at that point, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas I was just for one one year for three tours, so who knows? I don't know. But it was, wasn't was a fun thing. You never want to break your hand. No. Yeah. no. Tron will tell you the same thing. He's got a wrist surgery over there. You can talk, oh, yeah. talk war wounds later on. Um, so when you, when you come back, you're just in the indie scene, and is that is that just just hooking up with friends? Is that where wrestling is is? Well, no. So at that time, uh, <clears throat> I started to develop a little bit of a name on the independent circuit, and then I, I came over to the UK for the first time for uh, <clears throat> One PW UK and IPW UK. I think there's one of my matches early on against uh, Doug Williams, and then. Uh, there was another time I wrestled Jeff Jarrett over here. So I was doing stuff over here, and then I was doing a few shows like over, like in the US for Jersey All Pro Wrestling. And I was, I was starting to wrestle pretty regularly on the in independent circuit, but um, at that time, WWE was, was uh, knocking down my door to, to hire me, to be honest with you. So I was always wanting to go there, but I wanted to stay in Japan for, for longer and, and Tour longer, and actually, I had kind of an offer from Jeff Jarrett at that point uh, to to sign with TNA because when he had worked me for One PW UK, uh, he was really impressed with my work, and I was, yeah. you know, and uh, but it it didn't end up happening. So, but 
at that point, I was, I was starting to get some momentum, do some stuff. <clears throat> I did some work for uh, All Star Wrestling over here, over in the UK for Brian Dixon as well. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was a good, good experience, good, you know, yeah, not just Japan, but, you know, learning some different styles and working with some different guys. There were some, a lot of good guys at that round at that time, too. And are you off traveling on your own at this point? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I'm only like 20 years old, 19 young years old. Yep, that's just right. Setting off. Um, did you have, obviously, then, even when you were 19, 20, there wasn't that instant communication that we all have now. There isn't Facebook and Twitter. So, yeah. you're relying on pay phones and hotels and stuff like that there. Yeah. But was there Funny how times change, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was there always somebody on the end of the phone for you? You were sort of. I, I need advice for this, or were you just soaking everything up while you were there? Are you meaning in, like giving me advice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, me yeah, sure. I mean, I had. I mean, my uncle Brett was around at that time. Actually, Chris Benoit was around at that time. Brett was a uh, not that he was not around now, but he was he, like uh, I don't know how to explain. It. He was traveling more and doing more appearances and stuff. So yeah. I was on some. I was on the one PW UK shows with him too. So. The, uh, I would say, yeah, Chris Benoit was another guy that was that was really like a father figure, and he was giving me like I was talking to him, communicating him quite often at that time. Yeah. So, yep. And of course, you had a, a long history with him, with you, yep. obviously with your dad as well. Yes. Um, yes and training, so that's understandable that you know you would look to father figures if if you were crossing paths while you're on the road anyway, you know. Um. WWE slamming down your door, uh, you hit FCW, mm -hmm. um, obviously. Uh, yeah. There's been quite a lot of information spoken about FCW. Um, how, did, how did you find your time there? I mean, you were, you were highlighted as a star. You were, yeah. you were given titles. And you, you're not given titles, obviously you earned them. But you were given those opportunities. And um, how, did you, how did you feel when you got there? Sure, yeah, no, you know what, I'll, and I'll say this about FCW when I was there, um, <clears throat> the training facility when I was there was really, really good. Uh, Norman Smiley, Dr. Tom Pritchard, awesome trainers, awesome coaches, and looking back on it now, at the time I didn't really want to be, be there because, you know, you don't want to be there, you want to be up top and on TV and stuff like that. And they put the uh, first ever FCW Heavyweight Championship on me. And actually, it was funny enough, that was this, I think it was the two days after Chris Benoit had uh, offed himself and his family or whatever. But that was a hard thing, was everybody having to do that show. And of course, all the r roster doing it, you know, other places too. But um, I appreciated them putting stock in me, put it, making me the first FCW Heavyweight Champion. And I, at the time, I, I wasn't. I didn't want to be there because you want to be up top making. But looking back on it, I had some good memories. You know, I had some good tag team matches with Tyson Kidd. It was a really good atmosphere, uh, good training facility. I would have taken that way over OVW. I think that FCW was a better training facility. That th when I was there, I don't know about the old OVW that was. You know. Uh, distributing like Brock Lesnar and Randy Orton and Shelton. I think that OVW was dead when I was there, so. But, yeah. but it was good, I didn't, looking back on it, hey, it was a lot of good memories, a lot of good times, good people, yeah. Yeah, you had a quite an impressive roster that all sort of hit yeah. relatively within a, a two year period. They all managed to sort of move into the show and then that was kind of like the first generation of, of those NXT style, oh, we'll, we'll bring an entire generation of people in and, and try and push them through. Um, who out of that group then, obviously, because coming from a tight-knit family training uh, oriented, you had Tyson Kidd who was there, that was, uh, but who else was there that you were kind of like hanging out with? Who were you Who were you going out with? Who, was, who were you rooming with? And, like what sort of memories, like Fred's uh, personal memories do you take away from FCW and relationships? You know, I got along pretty much with everybody. Um, <clears throat> uh, Drew McIntyre, he was a really good talent that came from out of there at that time. Uh, Joe Hanning, he's Slater. Um, there was another guy, Eric Escobar, it was really good. Um, yeah, I got along pretty well with everybody. I have some funny stories too about that place. If, 
you want to branch yeah, into yeah, that yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Sure. That's that's kind of the that's kind of the road we were about to go down. Okay. So sure. yeah, so we, we we want you to DM drop and then we want you to tell the stories. Okay, hang on a second here. Because we got we did Drew we had Drew Drew came through um, one of our when we first did the Europa yep. Hotel. We had Drew over and he he was released earlier that month. Okay. And he told some brilliant like you guys. Was he full of piss and that. vinegar? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Did he t did he tell you guys about the story about Gustav? No. Okay. So, uh, WWE appointed this uh, guy named Ty Bailey to be, at that time, to be hiring talent for some reason. And all that the guy was doing at that point was like hiring uh, girls that he'd see at Hooters and stuff like that, or swimsuit, out of swimsuit models. Uh, he was apparently a good business guy. His dad was worked um, as one of the managers for the Miami Dolphins, but he just had no idea about where or how to hire talent and stuff. So I guess he, he got an email from this guy named Gustav, and Gustav said, and he was, t to a certain degree, he was telling the truth. So he said that he was a third generation wrestler, and he sent in a picture where he was, you know, not on the wellness program. He was huge. <laughs> and he said that he spoke uh, Brazilian Portuguese, English, and German, which that, those three things are true. And he was a third generation wrestler. And so Ty thought, oh, wow, I've just, you know, I've landed the, I've landed a gold mine here. Wow, you know, they, WWE loves this with going national. So he hired this guy without even knowing anything about him. So this Gustav guy shows up first day, and he's got these really, really high shorts, like from the Wonder Years. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he's wearing like uh, kind of like these boots, but like construction worker boots. You know what I mean? Like the the brown uh, steel toe boots. And he's just kind of strutting around. And he, he and his profile it said he was 270 pounds. And he shows up, and Dr. Tom Pritchard's like, "So you're Gustav?" And he's like, "Yes." And he goes, "So uh, where's your uh, wrestling boots, Gustav?" And then he goes, oh, I had so much stuff to bring from Brazil. You know, I just couldn't pack. I didn't have it. He goes, well, you know, you're kind of coming here to pro wrestle and you got signed to a contract. You kind of need your wrestling boots. Oh, yeah. And then somebody else, you know, is like, oh, step on the scale. And then it's like, he says he's 221 pounds. They're like, well, your thing says 271. Oh, yeah, you know, I moved from Brazil. I had so much stress. I lost a bunch of weight. And they're like, well, you lost like uh, 50 pounds in a month. So it's like, okay. So he gets in the ring, and then he, they, we would do a thing to start off every workout. FCW, you lock up, grab a headlock, shoot the guy off the ropes. You do crisscross for like maybe 10 times just to warm up everybody. Then two other guys would lock up, you know, blah, blah, blah. So this guy, he, I think he was doing it low-key, actually. So he goes to lock up, and he locks up the wrong way. And then Loki was like, you know, and he grabbed a headlock. And then he shot him off the ropes, and he ran off the ropes and hit the ropes the wrong way. And I could see Norman Smiley, like, watching him. And right as he's, like, bouncing off the ropes, and Loki just kind of stops because he's, like, it, it's, not, it's not timed right because yeah. he's doing it for the first time. He has no idea what he's doing. So he ends up... He goes through the ropes one other time, and he goes through the top and second rope, and he, like, smashes into the wall. But thank God, lucky for him, it was the wall with the crash pad against it. And he hit it like a bug and just fell down, and everyone just goes, oh! And as right as it was right about to happen, Norman smiles and goes, Tom, who's this guy? He, he, he's the shit. And bam! He hits the, <laughs> he hits the wall and just falls down. And then everybody like is like, oh, and he stands up and he says he's okay. So then they ask Gustav, like, what's the story here? You know, like you're a third generation wrestler. What what the hell? You know, you don't have wrestling boots, you look like you look like shit. And he <laughs> and uh, you know, and so the story was he his grandfather showed him the wrestling on TV when he was living in Germany as a kid. And that's what he meant by he was a, his and his, his grandfather did some amateur wrestling or something. So anyway, this Gustav guy, there's an old FCW episode that was, I think it aired, he had some silly name. And then they had him, 
one episode he was dressed up as one of the wrestlers named Sweet Poppy Sanchez because they didn't know what else to do with him, right? And, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I think there was the post-WrestleMania meeting that they had where they would meet and be like, hey, you know, Steve, Norm, Norm and everybody, like, who in FCW is doing good, who's maybe not doing so good, who's going to get cut? You know, everyone right away is like, Billy Kidman, Gustav. Everyone, Gustav, Gustav. And Ty was standing there like, ooh, all scared. And then Johnny's like, oh, you know, maybe he'll, he'll develop into something. You never know, you know. Give him a little more time. If he doesn't, we'll just cut him. And then they, and then they cut him, so. But yeah. Gustav, he, you know, stole whatever, six months worth of money and then three months for uh, after he got fired for... And, oh, and you know what? When he got fired, too, that's, that's the best thing. When he got fired, he didn't know he got fired. He sh he, yeah, he showed up at... Uh, <laughs> Gustav, he showed up... I swear to God, he showed up at FCW's uh, tapings that night. I think it was on a Wednesday night that they would do it. And uh, he, so he storms, comes through the door and... Tom and Norm and, and uh, uh, Steve Kern, they all got the heads up like, okay, Gustav got fired today. So he shows up and Tom's like, hey, Gustav, what you doing here? He goes, oh, I showed up. It's uh, TV tapings. Do I have a match, Tom? And he goes, and he looks at the paper. He's like, no. Uh, he's like, hey, Gustav, did you get a phone call at all today? And he goes, yeah, I had some unknown numbers call me, but I didn't answer it. <laughs> and then Tom's like, okay, well, uh, you know, you kind of got to answer those calls. You know, you never know who it is or what it is, you know. So it all of a sudden starts going around to all the guys that, hey, Gustav got fired, but he didn't pick up his, his call and he showed up here. So it starts going around and this guy, he's, he didn't get it at all. So a couple guys come up to him and just are like, Hey, Gustav, I heard you got fired today. And he goes, ha, ha, I heard you got fired, ha. <laughs> and then, like, and then a few other guys started coming up to him and saying it. And then all of a sudden, like, I kind of, I felt bad for him because I could see his face kind of, like, was like, oh, shoot. And he went up to Tom after, and he goes, hey, Tom, did I get fired today? And then Tom goes, uh, Gustav, um, tomorrow morning you're probably going to get a phone call, and you know, you have to pick up that phone call, all right? He's like, so, so did I got fired? Oh, I, I don't know. You got to pick up that phone call, okay? <laughs> and then uh, the next morning, he got the call, but he should have answered it. But he didn't know he got fired, and he was still, I think Steve Kern was just laughing. He's like, ah, he didn't know he got fired. Ah. <laughs> Good stuff. We've had a couple of people like he's that. A le he's a blues. legend down in uh, FCW. If you ask Drew or any of those guys that, Actually, you know what? Uh, he was in a battle royal in some random uh, little town in Tampa, or not Tampa, in, uh, in Florida. And everybody was like, of course, because he was in there, they were chopping the, the hell out of him, beating the hell out of him. I just, I was, me and Drew were the only two guys that didn't, I didn't touch him really. And then afterwards he came, like, was, he was complaining about getting stiffed and someone like, you know, told him that he should call everybody out on being stiffed. And he was, he's like, oh, you know, I've been in a lot of street fights and, you know, everybody was hitting me as hard as they could. I could feel it. Look at my chest. And his, I've, his chest was all blue and purple. He goes, the only two guys in the, in the Battle Royal tonight that were professional that didn't stiff me was Drew McIntyre and, and Harry Smith. And then Steve goes, ha, ah! He goes, you mean to tell me Harry and Drew the two biggest crowbars we have didn't stiff you? <laughs> And he's like, yes. He's like, oh, okay. But I just, I didn't feel it was, I didn't feel necessary to stiff him just because, you know, he just didn't know what he was doing. And yeah, it's not his fault. No, it's not. It was actually someone should have done that to Ty Bailey for hiring him. <laughs> you know, so. So crazy FCW, what's the craziest thing you've seen either in front or behind the curtain at an independent show, because in indies can get quite exciting at times. There's quite a lot of strange drama goes on backstage, believe it or not. Jeez, man. Uh, hmm. Well, I'll tell you this story. It's another funny story. So there was a guy named Dave English that was, uh, he showed up and he was training in the dungeon. 
And he, this guy was just such an idiot. He, he was obsessed with the Ultimate Warrior, and he thought that he was always talking about how he thought he was just as big as him, and his back was as big as his, and the guy just, he didn't look good at all, like, you know what I mean? He, was, he had a little mullet and stuff. So <clears throat> anyway, me and TJ at the time, we told uh, this Dave English guy, we're like, hey, Dave, you know, like, sometimes on a Saturday morning, the, uh, the newspapers come here, and they take pictures, and all the guys dress up as their favorite wrestlers. <laughs> so like, well, TJ's like, you, what you should do is, he's like, Bruce will really love it. He's like, you know, you come down here, and you'll be dressed up as Ultimate Warrior, and like, you know, everyone, they'll take pictures of it. You'll be like the, you know, for sure you'll be on the front page. He goes, oh, really? He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, okay. So he shows up, and, and he had these, like, uh, really cheesy, I don't know if you ever remember them, like the bright green and, like, pink and yellow shoelaces, and he tied them around his arms, and he tied them around so tight his arms were turning blue, and he, he had, like, this, one of those, I don't remember, like, the old school gym singlets. He had that on, and, like, a couple, you know, bandanas tied around his ankles and stuff, and then he started painting his face. And uh, my Uncle Bruce comes down in the dungeon. He has no idea about this, and he's just kind of looking on him, you know, whatever. There's, like, in the, in the dungeon, everything was always packed. So he goes, he needed someone to draw the ultimate warrior, little warrior on his forehead. And Ted goes, oh, my cousin Teddy Hart's like, oh, I'll draw that for you, Dave. So he, so he, drew, a, he drew a penis on his head <laughs> with a couple of balls. And then... Uh, this Dave guy was such an idiot, like, if someone was to draw something on my forehead, I would like to go and check in the mirror and see, you know, how, how does it look, but he didn't, and he just got on the mat and started wrestling with, uh, I think it was Carl LaDuke, and Bruce was just, like, looking at him, and my, he kind of, I think Bruce knew the rib, and my Uncle Ross came down, and he's, he's kind of like Principal Skinner from The Simpsons, <laughs> and he came down and had this, just this perplexed look on his face, and he's wondering why Dave is dressed up like this, and him and Carl are just, they're having this real little tussle on the mat, like a couple of uh, sledgehammers making love, like it was just awful. It was like they were, it was their first day of <laughs> wrestling again or something, and I could tell Carl was getting frustrated because he was, it was just such a bad session. And then Ted starts yelling to him. He goes, hey, hey, dickhead, you better do better. Dickhead, Dave. And then my Uncle Ross goes, Ted, watch your language. And Ted goes, no, Ross, look, he does have a dick on his head. And Ross just looks at him. Come on, guys. You're having a really lousy session here. Get, pick it up. But it was bad. And then Dave never asked us where the, the newspaper guys were or anything. But he didn't, he didn't last very long. So that was a good story. There's there's an Irish connection to the dungeon, Blake Norton. Do you, do you remember any? Yeah, I knew I knew Blake. Yeah. Do you know Blake? A yeah. little bit. That's a good check. Blake had, had come across our lives a few years ago. Oh yeah, I I don't know. I haven't heard from him in years. So no, that's cool. Does he have a good reputation here? I don't know. No, Blake Blake's Blake's Blake. He yeah, ran, yeah okay. he, he ran he ran a company for a little bit. On oh, the, on okay. The training school. He's, he's Blake. Okay. But he's, he's more I haven't nice heard I haven't heard from him in years, but I remember him and his girlfriend Tina at the time. They were when they first started training, but I haven't seen him in years. No, that's cool. So um, we uh, have to ask you about the Stu Hart Heritage Championship. Yeah, do you still hold that? I do. Um, and it was Teddy. Y yeah, you know what we. Uh, initially, what I wanted to do was, what Brett wanted to do was, um, he wanted to make the title and have me defend it wherever I could, uh, or wherever I can, and unfortunately, just because I've been so busy in Japan with the tag team thing, I haven't been able to do enough with it, but what I, what my, Brett and I, what we had envisioned for it is to have really, really good matches defending the title, like say when he was, when Brett would wrestle like Nick Bachman, Colin Calgary, and they would go 60 minutes to a draw, or uh, when, you know, Dory Funk would wrestle Harley Race in, in Calgary, or th th that sort of like very long, very good quality matches defending the title. Um, so I, I, I wanna do more with it, I just haven't been able to because of, yeah. I, you know what I mean, and I, I think that and I don't want Brett to think that I'm not trying to do it because it's a beautiful title. It's it's awesome. I want to do more with it. 
Uh, but I, you know, hopefully if I come back here again, we, uh, we can do a, something, you know, a good title defense with it or something like that. But it, it is one thing I will say about titles, and I love them. They're the worst things to travel with because they're, they're heavy. <laughs> Whenever you put them through the screener, they're always like, oh, open your bag, you know. Yeah. And then when you're traveling with it, you're always worried, like, uh, about somebody, I mean, you never know, somebody stealing it, somebody, or it being left behind, it getting dropped, it getting yeah. screwed up. So it, it, it's, a, it's a really nice thing. I want to do more with it. I just haven't been able to because of yeah. being busy in Japan and with the tag team thing. So well, we have a 10 year anniversary show coming up this year. At some point, we might be able to do, do something. That would be awesome. Maybe. Yeah. Let's see. We'll talk good. to Terry T and see what he says. That would be appropriate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Leave it in Terry's hands. It's his fault. Uh, <laughs> so we're World of Sport. Just to, to, to catch up, debuted World of Sport New Year's Eve. It was very exciting. V very it, secretive in this modern time ah, of technology. Yes. How, did, how did that stay quiet? It, it was, you know what? That was such an awesome experience for me. Um, and you know what? It was one of those things that it really did come up last minute. And I'm glad that it, uh, I'm glad that it happened, but wow, that was stressful, like, just getting, t like, because I, I got told about it, and I was like, oh, geez, but because I was flying from Calgary to um, San Francisco for a show for Big Time Wrestling, and then I was going to come home, and then be home for a couple days, and then I was going to fly from Calgary to Japan. So this world of sport thing came up, so I was going to have to fly from, and the, the Japanese, they had already gotten the ticket from like the round trip Calgary to Japan back. So with the World of Sport thing, it came up. So I had to fly straight from uh, San Francisco all the way to the, to the UK, UK to Japan, land that same day in Japan the way that the flight worked, and drive literally straight to Cork and Hall, and I wrestled Alejandro Saez, uh, if for Noah. It was a really good match, but... I mean, flying in that day when you and then like and wrestling like an hour later is, was was like, but it, it turned out good. So when World of Sport contacted me, he said, "Yeah, you know, I'm all good. You know, we fig we'll figure it out." And I got my passport, my UK passport. So okay, we're good. And then they were figuring out the flights. So I go and get my passport and I look and okay, I got it. It just expired like two weeks ago. I'm like, because I haven't used it. I'm like, oh Jesus, and I'm running around. I'm calling the, the passport office. No, well, you can't really do it with a UK passport. And it, it, so they luckily got me a visa within 24 hours. And the, the world of sport thing came up like, I want to say less than a week before. And I was told right. to don't tell anybody, so, except for my sister. Well, she helped me get her anyway. So, uh, And, you know, I told a few family members. And then when I came in, I was brought into a, a secret room whenever... And then that same day when they were filming it, all the guys from World of Sport came over and talked to me, and we, you know, figured out how the show was going to go. So, and it was, I, I felt like the, the entrance and everything was done really, really well, really perfectly. It was done very, very professionally. Um, the atmosphere and stuff inside of there was really, really good. Having Jim Ross commentate it was like a huge plus. I mean, yeah. he did such an awesome job, him and Alex Shane. And I mean, everybody was really spot on with the show. So I just sent them a message and asked about what's, what's new. And they said that they have stuff coming up. It's just that they're just waiting and going back and forth and stuff. So Paperwork. And that's just the, the waiting time, waiting thing with the, with the wrestling business. So I, I hope that they do more with it. Because I certainly would think that I would be a, a good stable mate to it, yeah. and uh, yeah, I can't wait to come back. It was definitely it was definitely exciting to see. I mean, I'm not I'm a wrestling fan. That's I'm quite lucky to be in the position I'm in. So when you're sitting down, and I haven't uh, just over recent times with a hectic life and, and young kids and stuff, I haven't got to sit down and watch lots of wrestling. So when it comes on to ITV, it's kind of nice because you don't have to do anything to find it or get it. It's it's there for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And then boom, the, whoa! Because the music kicked first, and you're yeah. like, oh, oh, brilliant! This is just that's a really nice yeah. touch. And yeah. It felt very very homely, and it felt like a nice nod to the past. 
Um, Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, so did, 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 did the guys there know what was how you were coming, or was that was it kept secret? No, from them that, the the only guys that knew were um, the uh, the the higher ups there. Like even even the, the referees, nobody knew. I I I, I want to say Jim Ross probably he probably knew. But other than that, nobody knew. Right up to the point where you walked through the curtain? No, no, no. Uh, until right. that day, like that yeah, afternoon, yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody knew. And then we went over stuff. But when, before I had gotten into the arena, because the arena was attached to the, there was a hall, I think it was like whatever hotel was next door, Holiday Inn or whatever. So I went down before everybody got there, went into a room. They brought everybody to a room and said, okay, here's the deal. He's debuting tonight. And then I came in through the room. Introduced myself, said hi to everybody, figured out what I was going to do. So, but it wasn't until that afternoon that they knew I was coming. So, lottery is die, right? Yep, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's just how you do it. Yeah. And of course, this is your return to the UK, coming back, and uh, your little sister jumps all over it. Yeah. Didn't it's wait weird. a second. As soon as you were confirmed, there was an email. Oh, can you tell me where Harry's staying. I'd love to come over. <laughs> and take over his Q and A. Yes, basically. So um, she is going to join us uh, on stage right now. Please welcome Miss Georgia Smith, everybody. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> welcome, Georgia. Georgia Smith, everybody. Welcome. Bright light, bright light. They are bright, aren't they? So, how have you been since this morning when I spoke to you? <laughs> Good. Uh, we had a nice little uh, private taxi tour. Yeah. That was interesting. Taxi tour around Belfast, which is more depressing than you would think, but it's... It, it was <laughs> interesting. It's very red brick, though. It's very, like, here's, here's, here's a bit of new road that we've built, and here's some more new road. And here's an old building. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you're staying in a pretty nice spot. Um, over beside the water, and you've got um, everything's pretty close in Belfast. McHugh's is across the road. Belfast I'm going to see the Titanic spot. thing tomorrow. Yeah, lots of stairs. Fun. Get ready. Wear flats. Get it's ready. <laughs> Brace yourself. <laughs> so of course you're not just here to 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 take over the, the from the dojo from the dungeon to the dojo from the dojo from the from the dojo. Um, you're here to talk about um, the campaign, of course, for your father. To get yeah. into the, the WWE Hall of Fame. Um, it's over 2,500 signatures now. 12,000. 12, 12,500. Um, and how's that going? How did it even come about? Because we've, we've seen you on, on Wrestle Talk TV talking yep. about like, the start of the campaign yep. and, and getting the ball rolling and how you'd maybe got a few inside nods from, from Vince and, and things like that there about what was happening. So, how's, how does things sit at the moment? Yeah. Oh, and uh, I'll just. Um, tell one quick story since we're in Ireland also. Uh, when my father was wrestling for the WWF at that time in 1991, I'm sure that you know with Northern Ireland over here what things were like back then. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the, the agents and you know the producers, they were telling my dad not to wear the Union Jack flag on his trunks at all. And they were saying, oh, if you go out there, you're going to get shot or, you know, we're going to get bombed or something, you know. And then he said, well, you know, and he's and he stuck by it. He said, no, these are this is my country's colors. I'm going to wear it. And he wore it out and he said he got a huge ovation. So that was a really awesome thing to it's kind of a cool story, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Twenty five years later, we were <laughs> in the office yeah. going, do we put the Union Jack on the poster? Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, oh. It's a difficult one. Surely nobody could take offense to it. But yeah, that we've had our recent issues with flags or flags. We call them flags. Flags. Um, yeah, flags. I remember my dad told me he all. saw like some riots on the streets and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, it was kind of a crazy time. I mean, I can remember growing up as a kid, we had like, um, you couldn't get into the town center. You couldn't drive into the town center, so they closed town center off. In Belfast itself, you couldn't actually get into the shopping district without going through security, getting bag checks and stuff. And uh, I, I, like the last, the last real last part of it was like I think I was 15 or 16, and I was playing rugby at school. And um, you're telling me about that. This yeah, morning. the Thiefel Barracks bomb went off, 
uh, while we were actually training for rugby. And you know, I remember my coach at the time was like, don't panic, boys, it's okay. <laughs> Walked to the other side of the pitch and God. a bonnet landed right beside yeah. him, a bit of bonnet, and he just bolted. This old man with a hip replacement, he just took off. So, I mean, it is, I think, um, I'm probably like the last generation of people here who, who, who went through too much of it. Um, I think now we're kind of blessed that a lot of people just don't, they want to have fun, they don't, yeah. yeah. We, 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 I, I've read interviews, you talk about connectivity and, and wrestling fans getting together and, and, and how it, it raises the profile because you can talk directly with people who are interested in the same things as you. And I think that's where we find more unity in that let, let's, let's congregate around something that we really enjoy rather than something that we do that this other person over here doesn't, you know? So I think Northern Ireland has progressed slightly um, we're not rioting them too often, I don't think, on the streets. It, it's, it kicks up every couple of years. It really, yeah, once a year, it's not too bad. But um, and of course, the the, the the campaign. Then we forward like yeah, I, um, I can yeah, you're talking about that. I can remember your 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 father growing up as a kid. I always remember him as thinking he had bigger arms than than Hulk Hogan. <laughs> because they did the big sell of 24 inch pythons, and I, even the toys, he looked like he had bigger arms. Yep. You know. It, that's that's how I th I think about him. He was bigger than Hulk Hogan. So yeah. So how how is the campaign going? How, how do you think it? Well, Michael, who runs it, he's like on it day and night, and he's putting like every dime he makes into it. This is Michael Finney. Michael Finney. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Michael Finney. And he started the campaign in 2013, just him on his own. It's just always been him on his own. He's had some wrestling fans kind of help out with it, but Michael is doing everything for it. And yeah, now he's raised almost 13,000 signatures just on his own. I'd like to say I helped with it, but I, he he's made yeah. the the flyers. He's done everything for it. I've spoken a bit of it, like on Wrestle Talk and things like that, and obviously like retweeting it or promoting it online. But it's it's all it's all Michael. Yeah. At what what point did your your mom? Because it's supported by DianaHart.com and, and and all those things. What point did she jump on and? Oh. <laughs> So she made a she made a video for it, and it was oh, I don't know if Harry saw moment, it. Is it? Uh, she she did like because she's on like the celebrity video thing. Harry's on that as well, but like you're just supposed to say like, hey, this is what you're. And, and she just had she's like outside and she's freezing and looked like a blanket. She's like, hi, Michael, it's Diana. <laughs> if you <laughs> if you want to just sign this petition, I hope you're well. It's like it's not a personal message <laughs> to Michael. You're trying to. You know, promote it. Yeah, and yeah, she was like, yeah. "So in Calgary today, it's I think it's minus 30. My eyes are watering, and oh God, it's cold. And thanks for everything." You're like, oh God. So when you mentioned that, she's been with the camp. She did that video. Bless her heart. She she was just trying to. I don't know what she was doing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I put my hand. Just my when your hand mom's like, oh dear. Dad, so. Yeah, so it's just it's just parents being parents, yeah. and I suppose like. Is it doesn't matter if you're in the public eye, or if you're a wrestling no. family, or wherever you're coming from. There is like everyone gets embarrassed by their parents. Yeah, like I guess I'd rather her do that than like read a script and be like, "Hi there, if you would like to." Like I'd prefer, at least it had some. But when I watch it now, I'm like, "Oh, why would? Wow. Why did you see that?" No, but I could see that. <laughs> and why is she outside? I don't know. <laughs> Snowing. I don't know. Anyway, but uh, yeah, Michael's done a really good job with it, and um, he's like actually calling like WWE all the time. I don't know who he's getting, who he's connecting to. I don't know what number it is, but he's he's calling. He's doing things. He's you know. Power it does. Drugs. It started to obviously whenever we announced that you were coming over, we 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 started to get contact from from everyday fans. Sharing it in, go make sure you mention it, make sure you give it out. We're going to be putting some information out yeah. to Facebook this evening. We didn't want to bombard you guys too much beforehand. Um, so the links and everything are going to be there, but you can go on. It's The Facebook is just Team Davy team, Boy team, Smith .com. Yeah. Or that's the website. And then on Facebook, I think it's just Team Davy Boy Smith. Yeah. And then on Twitter, I, f I don't know if it's got a Twitter page. I know Mike. Is that what it is? Because I know Michael does a lot of things on there. Oh, okay, so on Twitter, it's Team DB Smith. Yeah. We'll get it yeah. sorted. We'll, all, we'll get it. All the information's there. Please go and support it. Um, obviously, w what's the goal there? How many signatures? Or is it just, just get it just done? Just until he's in there, really. Yeah. You know, I get asked all the time, like, why? I, I don't have 
Harry knows. I don't have an answer. No answer. You, you've maybe thought that it was, it's just a matter of time. Please it is a matter of year. time. He needs to be the main eventer, or is it? Is it going to be we're going to get something in the UK from them in regards to WrestleMania? I have something? no idea. That's like the most logical thing. But at the same time, I'd like if we kind of had an idea, if it was like, okay, it's going to be next year, it's going to be two years, it's going to be five years, because Harry and I, you know, have lives, and we, like, we want to make it a special event, so we want to like put something into it. We don't want to just be told like two weeks beforehand and have to, Harry cancels events, I cancel things just to go down and, yeah. you know, like we want just, I know WWE obviously, like they have their own thing going on, but yeah. well, just to get. He's know. tearing it up in Japan. Doing Thanks. serious things. Yeah. Um, you're doing a bit of voiceover work right here. Yeah, just, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, bits of it, yeah. Yeah, bits and pieces and building a career there. Yep. And of course, uh, Teach and educate the young. I'm educating the young yeah. as well. Yes. Yes. So, and uh, Northern Ireland, just as cold as England. <laughs> yeah, just Colder. as cold. A little bit greener, though. A little bit greener. It's not too bad. We're friendlier, definitely, anyway. Yeah, you guys, like, I notice when I go into a shop in the UK, it's like they don't make eye contact with you. They don't ask, like, hey, are you okay? Or anything. It's just like, man. And they just play on their phones. Whereas here, they're like, how are you doing? Are you all right? Oh, good. Oh. They stop doing. They actually stop doing that if you tattoo your hands. Believe it or not, tattoo your hands. And they just put the money on the counter and don't speak to you at don't all. Touch me. <laughs> <laughs> That's how to do that. So yes, yeah, so growing up, brother and sister. Um, any competition between you two growing up over anything? Or nope. Any <laughs> sports or because you you just no. had no interest in wrestling. No, he whatsoever. had the wrestling dolls. I had like the Barbie dolls. And. Did you ever go and steal a wrestling doll to go out on a date with a Barbie doll? No. <laughs> you sure? No. Felt no. Because they were Macho all like, man weren't like, taking out Barbie. Like he had like the old school, like the big rubber ones, and they, they yeah. like Ken's like Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas like I don't know, like recruit or something's like it's just like a big rubber thing. I don't. know. Those it, old it action work. figures, you could throw them off a building, they would survive, <laughs> man. <laughs> Those things were built to last. <laughs> yeah, so um, what, what, what would be your sort of like standout memories? Yeah, like, obviously, Davy Boy Smith is your father first, the head of, of, of being a wrestler. And are your standout memories around the wrestling arenas? Or yep. is that at home for you? Is it? A little bit of both. Because you, you are essentially celebrating his achievements in the ring, you know, so they are family achievements as well. Like, yeah, I would say Harry's in my biggest memories because we didn't really have our dad at home, so we would just see him on TV. Yeah. And, you know, we, when we'd see him at events as well. So at home, he was, he was usually just wanting to, like, relax and stuff and just, like, train and sleep. And I'm, I'm not saying, like, he didn't get involved with things, but whereas on TV he was something else. And yeah. you know what I mean? And yeah, that's definitely, that's my biggest memories is, is seeing him on TV. I don't know if that's for you as well. Yeah, exactly what she said, pretty much, you know. It's, it's the spectacle of the big massive Union Jack. The that's right, yes, the arm. Yes, exactly. Unclipping the, yeah. Um, and then at home, he, he, he wore a lot of denim. More Big. sweatpants. I would always yeah, be like, sweatpants. why don't you wear more jeans? Like, he'd do photo shoots and, like, sweatpants. Like, you have you guys seen, like, the British guy with the fanny pack and the sweatpants? <laughs> tucked into, like, and I remember he'd do photo shoots, and I'd be like, why don't you wear jeans? And he'd be like, they don't, they're not comfortable. I don't, they don't, I, they, well, I don't like we're, them. We're starting, if you, if you notice, down yes. this region it's down It's beginning. Here, the, it's the beginning. Luke's starting to return, and obviously you had the pictures. I, I will say this. The new um, SWAT boots here, because they, they used to be the Magnum boots. The, the, these are like the most comfortable boots I've ever worn. They be, they're more comfortable than the old Magnum boots. I see you I don't swear. have the, two, the shoelaces tied either. Well, you know, I want to relax. Yeah. He's in Belfast. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want to relax. I want to relax. Just wants to chill out. Have a bit of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Have a bit yeah. of fun. <laughs> Just don't trip or anything. Yeah. That won't be good. You came out and tried to steal his thunder here. You uh, have to behave yourself. That's right. That's what we'll send you back off the stage. So anyway, um, Belfast, uh, like, I mean, you're going to obviously be here for a few days. Uh, we've got the Europa Hotel tomorrow. Georgie, you've been around the town. Fortunately, you got, as we mentioned earlier, to to delay <laughs> today. Um, hopefully you get to see a bit of the place tomorrow. Um, 
any plans for the UK later on in the year, bar the world of sport? Is it, have you got any contact, or is it, is it well, Japan? Is it I, I, I'm certainly hoping that they do more with the world of sport for this year. I mean, that would be awesome, especially one thing is like because they just debuted their show New Year's Eve, right? Yeah. And kind of the longer you wait, the more people kind of start to forget, and then you, you yeah. have to build that momentum. So I hope for business sake that it picks up more. And if they if it does, I'll certainly be readily available for that. And um, hopefully more stuff in the UK as well, you know, if yeah. it's for Revolution Pro or uh, mm -hmm. other companies over there. You know, I, I'll always love to come back over to the UK and, you know, How make good use out of my UK passport. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Oh, so we get a fantastic too. use. There's no, yes. no visas. No visas, no. Yeah. Money nope. saved. It's great. Yep. It's easier. You get through customs. Shelton Benjamin actually had some difficulties getting through, but uh, Shelton's quite a smooth talker. So yeah. He just, uh, of course. He just swooned on past everybody. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yep. no, it was all good. Um, obviously, Georgia, you're in England at the moment. There's crazy wrestling scenes sort of erupting all over the place. Uh, what's it like over there? You're based in the Midlands at the moment. I've been to some good shows and I've been to some bad shows. <laughs> You want to tell us about any bad shows? We've had them. Hey, oh, no, we've, we've had some bad shows. I've seen a bad show with him, and it was terrible. Which one? <laughs> no, just the kidding. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can tell him if you want. I don't want it. It was this horrible show. No offense to the person, but, like, there was seriously, like, how many people would you say was in the audience? At the it was just one of those shows that was just really... It was like a last ba minute. Badly prepared, last minute kind of in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in the UK. <laughs> he and uh, I just... <laughs> he, oh. gave, he gave somebody, like, uh, you did something like a power bomb and they yeah, shit I, themselves on the ring. Yeah. I gave him, I think it was, a, it was a big slam or something like that. And uh, bless his heart, the guy, he... <laughs> He let it all go, and he was wearing kind of a what thin was singlet. What gimmick? Was it like an Iron Sheik type remember. thing? He had like, like the little yeah, curly boots. Yeah, he was and poor like guy. And like sweatpants. And then thing? I just wanted to get the match over with, so we, <laughs> we did it, and then we get, came to the back, and I was like, oh, man, sorry, you, you know, you soiled yourself out there. And he was just, he was trying to play it off that he just did let, uh, let he just let one go, like, a, a, and I was like, no, man, you didn't, like, you know, are you okay? I hope. <laughs> Jeez, sorry about that. And then he's, and then you could see a big stain on the back, and the stain was in the ring too. And that, like, even my cousin Bronwyn, who's Dynamite's daughter, she was watching the match, and I'm like, I got out of the ring because it smelled. And then she was like, she's like, sh I was like, oh, Bronwyn, he, you know, he shit himself. And she's like, I know, <laughs> it smells. <laughs> and then afterwards, the one of the security guys was in the ring, and he was. Uh, he was mopping it up, and then there were some kids. <laughs> kids, you know, they snuck into the ring because they wanted to play in the ring. Like, <laughs> but they didn't. They didn't really were weren't aware. They just were playing, and then the the, Caret <laughs> the caretakers like mind the shit, <laughs> mind the shit, and he was cleaning it up. And uh, I think I cut a promo after the match, and I said something like, "Oh, it's good to be back. My opponent here gave me all he had, clearly," <laughs> and. <laughs> I pointed at it, and I, I think a few people caught on, but it, was, it was, wasn't one of the great shows I've been a part of, but good for stories <laughs> like story time now. <sighs> yeah. so Literally. We've had people go underneath the ring to be sick. I don't think we've ever had anybody shit themselves. So Tommy the ref nearly died one night in the ring, actually, and he doesn't, I don't even know if he knows he nearly died. In this room, we used to have our ring... It's been refurbed. It's good now. It's good to go now, but it used to be not the most reliable thing in the world. And it was in this room about nine years ago. And um, Tron, uh, quite a large bloke, seven foot tall, and he, it was against this wall, and he came against the top rope, and the, the corner just gave way. Now, we didn't know at the time. We just thought Tron had killed himself because he came... Oh. He came over the top rope, and there's two, there's double doors behind these things. And he Sounds like he did a Gustav. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he did a Gustav, but it was the rope's fault. So then he goes through, and he goes through the doors. So Tron disappears from sight. Nobody knows, so we don't know what's happened to him. Later on in the night, when we look back at the video, 
Tommy standing in the ring, and you can actually see him physically moving backwards as all the, the turnbuckle comes past his head. And you're like, whoa, that was a pretty close one. Better get that welded back together. That's, that's a bit tough. So we, we've been through our hardships, and we, we used to have no money and stuff, and now we, we've got a little bit more behind us. So we, we always try and build and give back to the fans. Um, I've been given a little bit of information that you might not be happy about, um, but maybe you will. But I was told to ask about what happened with Chris Masters in India. Oh, first, oh. first, first <laughs> before we get into that, I was, we were talking about, because you were saying how you brought somebody over uh, who was released at the same time Harry was from yeah, WWE. Drew. Drew. Or oh, no, no, Tron. Tron. Uh, Tron's here. Tron was, Tron was released from FCW. Right, okay, the at the same time. And then, yeah, I said, it was funny, I said, because Chris Masters and Harry were suspended and fired at the same time, and then they roomed in India, and if you'd like to continue from there. Oh, wow. So, uh, it was my, it was the second trip for the Rinka King that TNA was, was doing with uh, Andamal over in uh, Pune, India, and wow, so... I was rooming with uh, Chris Masters, and he's a great guy. He's funny. He's goofy. We always get along, but we're kind of like polar opposites personality-wise. So us rooming together was kind of weird, but whatever. So anyway, we we weren't really allowed to like leave the hotel, but we were there for like stints for like five days, and they would do like four episodes a day. So everyone was tired, and the ring announcer, the late she was a lady, I remember, she had a connection to go to a nightclub. And she invited everybody out. And I, I tell you, it was a really nice nightclub in India. And I, I, aside from that nightclub, everything was really dirty, lousy, disgusting, to be honest with you. So this nightclub was amazing. They had waterfalls there and stuff like that. And, and uh, everyone was you know, having a good time and having drinks. So anyway, I was having uh, rum and, and Diet Coke, but because everybody was having tequila shots. And I, just, I was just kind of relaxing. I didn't realize it, but the rum and Diet Coke had melted ice cubes in it. And in India, you're supposed to stay away from the water. So I may as well have been just going up to the, wa the river and just going like. <laughs> so I wasn't really, about an hour in, and I was like kind of not feeling so good. I was like, okay, you know, and we, we left there. And uh, aside from that, I was keeping r like pretty good. Like I would, uh, I, you know, shower, but make sure you don't drink any of the water. I just didn't know. So in the middle of the night, I'm just going, man, I'm not feeling good. So we wake up the next morning, and I wake up at like 7, and I just, I'm just, i just like just curled over in bed, and I start like getting the shakes and stuff because, you know, you're starting to basically get severe food poisoning. And uh, I said, Chris, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not feeling good, man. I said, I'm, I'm, man, I, I'm just not feeling good. And he goes, oh, are you all right? I go, no. And he's like, oh, you know, just... We'll go down to the TV taping. I'm sure you're not doing much today. I go, no, man, I, I, I don't think I'm going to make it. And I just curl over, and then he's like, you all right? He's like, cool, just, we'll just call downstairs. And then I went to grab the phone, and I just, I couldn't. And he's like, and all of a sudden, he's like, holy, are you okay, man? So he stands up, and he calls downstairs. Luckily, so luckily, there was a hospital right across the street, so they took me in. They checked my white blood cell count, which was like 10,000 times the amount it's supposed to be, which means the body's fighting off a serious infection. They asked me what happened. I said, well, I was, they said, oh, yeah, da, 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 da. and they said, oh, there was me probably melted ice cubes, and I went, oh, Jesus, that, that, was, that was it. Uh, it was a good, quick way to lose like 15 pounds in three days. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not lying to you. And this is true, and it can happen. It came out of all ends at one time. Aww. Exploded out of me like a fire hydrant. <laughs> and so anyway, everybody was like kind of wondering, they, like, because I didn't show up the first day, and they were like, oh, you know, maybe he got a little bit sick, and then all of a sudden the they second day, hungover. yeah, they were just were like, oh, maybe he's just sick, or, you know, whether he's hung over, he's just, he didn't have to, he didn't have to come today because he didn't have anything to do for tapings. And then the second day, everyone's like, oh, shoot, something's wrong. So then everybody started visiting me. And they came in and they saw how lousy and disgusting and shitty this hospital was. There was my hospital bed and then there was a girl across from me. 
and she was, I don't know what was her problem, but she was, it was like something out of the movie The Exorc Exorcist, like she was just screaming at the top of her lungs in the middle of the night, like, like just for like, for hours, like, ah! and they, were, they would come in and give her whatever, and she would kind of calm down, and it would start again, and then I looked over at a, this old Indian man, and he was just, had his eyes closed the whole time, was just laying like this, and I didn't see him breathing, I think, I'm pretty sure he was dead. So, uh, Didn't you say the then, bathroom wasn't too Yeah, the, the bathroom was terrible. They would come in and just hose down the bathroom because people would have so many problems, like just with the water, and then it would go down a drain like because it, it, oh. it was that watery. And then when Chris Masters came to visit me, he was like, he goes, holy shit, bro. He goes, well, what have you been doing in here for three days? I said, um, and he goes, Oh, he must have had some pretty good talks with God in here, man. <laughs> holy, he was like, holy shit. So, uh, funny thing is, I, I, then as soon as this, as soon as I was, uh, they gave me the pass that I could leave the hospital, you know, I came out of there and I saw the guys at the hotel and Jeff Jarrett's like, oh, you've been doing a lot of running and leaning out there and, you know, because I was all skinny and I apologized to him. Everything was fine. Luckily, um, me and Chavo Guerrero, we were tag team champions, and the day, the, the day that I got sick, the storyline, we had dropped the titles to Abyss and Scott Steiner. So just by luck, I had kind of cleared up my business for, I had a few th other things the next couple days, but. And a funny thing is, about that story, is straight from India, I had to fly to Los Angeles and do, um, there was a wrestle reunion that High Spots does. So I was r scheduled to wrestle Davey Richards, and I was like, and I got to Los Angeles, and I was tired, and of course, coming out of India, like, totally weak, I went to, uh, uh, I think it was at LA Fitness, actually, too, there, and I worked out, or tried to work out, and I pride myself as being pretty good with, like, Hindu squats and stuff like that, like, I could bust out 500, like, nothing when I'm in good shape, and I did 50 and I was done. Like I was had nothing left in me, I was like, and I saw Davey Richards and I'm like, man, I'm like, we well, gotta really go slow with this match, I'm like, I, and he was, we were kind of going over lots of stuff and I'm like, dude, I don't know. I'm like, I, I don't know what I'm gonna have for this. I'm like, really sorry, I got sick in India. I lost like 20 pounds, I, I, I still feel kind of screwed up, the place sucks. Whatever, you know, and just by the luck of, or grace of God, I don't know how it, it happened, but when I went out there for the match with Davey Richards, I, we had an awesome match. Like, it was like, we were doing all kinds of counters with ankle locks and sharpshooters, and the crowd was going nuts for it, and it was funny, because Chris Masters came to that show that night, because it was in L.A., and he lives there, and he just, he was watching from the crowd, and he was like, he was popping like crazy, and he was like yelling to the crowd. He's like, this guy was just in the hospital for three days. He's like, holy shit. He was telling me, he's like, holy shit, man. He's like, that's the best match I've ever seen you have. He's like, the, the match was awesome. He's like, what, what happened? Like, I can't believe you did that. Like, you were, you were totally screwed up. And I was like, he's like, man, after seeing that, I want, to, like, I want us to work and do some matches. I'm like, oh, yeah, the, of course, it would be awesome. So if you ever talk to Chris, he will tell you that story. And, and yeah, India, wow. Uh, hopefully we won't go back there. Yeah. Uh, got Northern Ireland. We're just the next step up. <laughs> <laughs> Still houses in Northern Ireland with outside toilets. Well, they're slowly but surely knocking them down. Um, have a look out there in the crowd. If anybody has any questions at the moment, just while we're going to the last run here. Uh, if anybody has anything that we haven't covered or wants to speak about, and, uh, or we can just go straight back to more funny stories. Oh, Chris. Thank you, Alec. What about Owen going into the Hall of Fame anywhere down? Don't think that's going to happen. Well, uh, the big problem is, is um, with his wife, Marta, she's just really, really against it, and she has a lot of, a lot of pull and a lot of power to say whether he will or will not go into the Hall of Fame and she doesn't want him to go. So even the WWE released a DVD on Owen Hart and she was making all kinds of protests and was trying for it not to happen, which I don't necessarily agree with because the fans really wanna, like, you know, he wrestled in the company for 
you know, however many years. And it's something more for the fans. It's not for, I mean, of course, WWE's making money off it, but it's more for the fans. And it's the same thing with the Hall of Fame, but the Hall of Fame's a little bit different. She, there's more where she can say no. So mm -hmm. as far as that goes, I don't, I don't see that changing, unfortunately. So yeah, she was really mad about heart and soul as well. She was trying to like get that off the shelves because Owen was in it. But it's like, Martha, we can't pretend like Owen wasn't a part of the Hart family. We can't pretend that he wasn't a wrestler. We can't pretend that he, you know, like he wasn't some jobber. Like he was a major big, like he's a legend. Like we can't, yeah. but yeah. she wants to, and I, and I get like she's very mad and bitter and she hates Vince, but like don't, don't take it out like on the family. Like if you don't, if you don't like him and I get that, but it's like don't, you know, we, we can't just like, okay, well, let's just erase Owen. Let's pretend he wasn't in it. Like, we can't, we can't do that. Yeah. But, you know, with, with, and then when this DVD came out, she was like, she was livid. She was really, really mad. But, so yeah, I think, like what Harry said, like, she's got a lot of control with Owen. So I, I don't think, I think it's just going to be more of a hassle and problems if that were to ever happen. And I don't think WWE wants to, because it's just going to ultimately make them look bad. Smart business and just yeah, leave it alone. Yeah, exactly. Anybody else? Anything like that? Go ahead, Richard. Show me edge here. You were talking earlier on there about the, the large plastic figures, the LJM figures. Mm -hmm. One of my first figures was of your father. Of those in the, the sort of burgundy beige, or sorry, burgundy colored trunks. Yep. Uh, how did it feel when you saw your first figure, your first toy? Oh, yeah, that was, I mean, <clears throat> I guess kind of like a, a milestone in my career. <laughs> Just because I, I love action figures of all kinds. I'm a, admittingly a nerd when it comes to action figures of like pretty much anything. Uh, so I would even say that the action figure, it was cooler for me to get my first action figure than it was to see myself in a video game. Do you know what I mean? So it was, that, was, that was definitely a goal and like something really cool because I, I mean, I'm just, I love action figures, right? So. That was it was one one of the yeah one of the great things. Do you have any idea how hard it is to get hold of one of those? <laughs> is it? Yeah. Wow, that's good. Wow. Yeah. Well, had I known, I would have brought some over. Yeah. Next time, uh, tenth anniversary. Ten year anniversary. Yeah, that's right. We'll get some. I'll bring them. Ask and, Terry and, T. and you know what? The the one that's really hard for Carpet me. Carpet Kirshner. No, well, that, him too, but. Uh, the, the bearded Corporal Kirshner action oh. figure that's supposedly around, but uh, is the, I have one, but I wasn't able to find any more at all of the, with the Heart Dynasty tank top on, and I think it comes with a, a chair or something like that, but it comes with the, with the actual felt. I got one, and then it, when they released them, and I tried to get another one, and I couldn't, and I haven't been able to find any, anywhere. So... Uh, well, it depends on. He buys two. He opens yeah, one buy, and he saves that's one. That's exactly it. Yeah, I buy two. Yeah. Well, and then, you know what? Nowadays, I I like to keep better care of them and at the package and stuff and and. But, yeah. But if if I'm able to get two, I'll you know I'll, I'll, thank you very much. Um, I'll open one. Of course, you got to play with it, right? Um, one story, um, it's kind of to do with wrestling dolls, but when Harry was little, he was playing with his wrestling dolls, and he was like, ah, and then Matilda just bit him on the face. Yeah, she did. I have a little scar here right on my nose. I was playing with them, and I used to like to play with them near the fridge, because I'd play with the, the little fridge magnets, too, and, you know, you, with the letters and stuff, and she just went, came up and bit me right on the nose, and she was... Actually, she wasn't a really nice dog, you know. Yeah, she, was, <laughs> she, was, she was kind no. of a. And, and you know, I, she look, if you actually analyze, you go past it, it's like, oh, cool, put a dog out and everything. And then you looked at the actual face. It's, it's yeah. But like, it wasn't like she was. She just had a litter of puppies, and then she was brought on to like on the planes and stuff. Like, she must have had like a lot of stress and then oh, leaving yeah. her babies and just like, why am I going to these places? Why is this happening to me? And then. 
But like Matilda, like she she didn't like anybody but no. my dad. And she hated dynamite. She hated too. dynamite, and dynamite was kind of. A I think uh, dynamite tormented her <laughs> <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah, <laughs> he, yeah, he tormented uh, a lot of those animals pretty good. But, but like Matilda was like she'd come in the bed with my dad, and then she'd like just pee, and then my mom would be like, "What the like?" But she was like trying to mark her territory, like, "Lady, you're not coming in here." Yeah. <laughs> she was a bitch. My mom would be like, "Oh Christ, Matilda!" Like, yeah. pee in the bed. My dad was like, oh, God, got to clean the sheets. Yep. But yeah, she like, and she didn't like anybody going near him. So is that the next step for World of Sport is to bring back the bulldog? Or <laughs> oh, well. I know you recently you never said know, goodbye right? to your own dog. Yes, As that's did right. I yes. actually recently. Oh, I'm sorry to hear I, that. I tattooed myself because that's the oh, sort nice, of lunatic nice. I good, am. Good. But yeah, I got a dog when I moved out of my mum and dad's house when I was 20. So nice. same sort of idea. I had a few years. So I understand your loss and pain. Poor dogs. <laughs> so yeah, so anybody else, anything else they want to ask? Oh, we got another arm. What was it like whenever you won the tag team titles with Tyson being able to celebrate it with Brad and Natalia as well? Yeah, that was a really, uh, that was awesome, man. You know, that was really good. We had, um, I would say that as far as being in the WWE goes, that was probably the number one memory for myself. Like, the, the, the crowd was the reaction that we got as soon as we won it and Brett came in. It was really, really awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, winning the tag titles live on Raw like that was, was great. You know, and I have, an, I have two other memories that were really awesome with WWE. Um, and actually, what was really awesome was uh, both my... My two only experiences wrestling in Madison Square Garden for WWE were house shows, and they were both awesome experiences, which is great. One was um, when I was feuding with Tyson Kidd after we split up prematurely. Um, was wrestling him, opening match, Madison Square Garden in front of a sold-out crowd there. Really awesome match. <clears throat> great. And the second one was uh, me and and Tyson Kidd, we were teamed up uh, with Bret Hart against the Nexus for Bret Hart Appreciation Night. And that was, the, I mean, even though nobody really saw it because it was for a house show, uh, live event, I guess they call it now. But, you know, being in Madison Square Garden and having, you know, those two awesome memories, really, really great. But next to that would be the winning the tag titles for sure. Well, whenever you were going with Tyson and you're going up against him, mm -hmm. Is that pulling stuff out of the locker that you've done for years, or are you always trying to come up with something else so that you're not going to have somebody in the crowd going, well, I've seen that on YouTube, and I saw them do this then, and are you trying to come up with different angles and sort of how, you, how different sequences, how you get into things to, to make it different for the fans? Yes and no. Um, the one thing was that... <clears throat> because when we were wrestling in Stampede Wrestling and stuff like that, we were, we were, how should I say it? Uh, for a lot of the matches we did were, were like babyface versus babyface. So a lot of it was like the great classic wrestling and the fans chanting, you know, this is wrestling and we want more and blah, blah, blah. You know, that, that sort of stuff. Whereas with WWE, we had already split up and they wanted more of like a, kind of like a, like, a, like a hate feel to it. So, you know, Tyson Kidd would do something like take out my knee and blah, blah, you know, he would get aggressive on it. And we go back and forth, then we go into the kind of the fireworks and the false finishes and stuff like that. So it was a little bit similar, but a different kind of feel because it was supposed to be a, like a hate feel to it. But the only thing is that it doesn't really work that way because, and actually, the, Arn Anderson put it to me really well, and I, and I agreed with him, is he said when we split up, and he goes, it will work, but he said that a lot of times fans, they just won't buy that you guys really hate each other, and he goes, the thing is, you know, you split up, you probably come back together in a couple of years, which we didn't, which is fine, but he said that, you know, even when the Hardy Boys, when they split up and they're wrestling each other, they were having great matches, and they wanted this, like, hate feel to it, but the fans never bought it. And then, you know, they wound up getting back together. It's the same thing as the Steiner brothers when they split up Rick and Scott. N nobody, nobody can really buy that you really hate your own brother or your own teammate or something like that. And it, as much as you want to get that point across, that there's that 
you know, it just doesn't work. So it, it did it did work and it didn't. And yeah. when Arn told it to me, I was going, ah, and then when it happened, I was kind of like, I, I see what he means now. So yeah. so we, we would make the matches a little bit different, but similar in, yeah. in, in a way. And there was a question over here. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Obviously, recently, um, Lance had his back injury. Yes. To go out to Japan. Um, any word on how he's doing, and how do you think that's going to change things for you going forward now with him, Suzuki? Sure. Yeah, that was unfortunate. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Lance, he, he hurt his back like last year with working with Pro Wrestling Noah, and I could kind of tell that it was bugging him. Um, but just with certain things he would do in the ring where he wouldn't, like he would, he, we would always sit down with our finishing move, but he didn't, and he kind of stopped, he would just throw the guy down. So I knew for quite a while he was having a, a problem with his lower back and his sciatica. And then the last day, or the last, uh, the last day when he wrestled in Cork and Hall, I could see he was really bad and he couldn't even walk after. And I was like, man, geez, you know, he must be hurting because he's uh, seen him fight through this before. And then when I found out he needed surgery, it was like, wow. So I certainly wish him a speedy recovery. And um, I, I certainly hope that, and I don't want to sound bad at all with this, but I certainly hope that it gives me an opportunity to do more singles stuff in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And not that, not that I'm going to say that the, I don't like the KES. I, teaming with Lance has been great. But at the same time, I mean, because they, they want like kind of like a monster tag team image and stuff like that. And sometimes in a lot of situations when you're in matches in Japan, because in New Japan there's so many guys right now, there, there's so many foreigners, I get involved in a lot of like six-man or tag team matches or eight-man tags where it's a lot of just kind of in and out <clears throat> sort of stuff. So it's hard for me to showcase my stuff as a singles competitor in that sense. So I'm hoping that I can showcase my stuff as a singles competitor and say, for instance, you know, go up against guys like Shibata, you know, like some of the Japanese guys that I've felt like I've really been able to showcase my best, truly my best stuff over there in the G1 climaxes I've been a part of and stuff. But at the same time, I hope Lance makes a speedy recovery and we can pick up where we left off. I think that I'm, it's fair to give me the opportunity to be a singles competitor in Japan. So I, I, I don't know, that's just my opinion. That's what I'm, I'm hoping for. New Japan, they might find a new guy for me to team up with. I, you know what I mean? I have no idea, they, you never know. I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, I would certainly wouldn't hope that because Lance and myself are already established and you know, when he comes back, that would be like, we got a third guy, kind of like third demolition member crush. <laughs> <laughs> but kind of like that. But you know what I mean? So hopefully it winds up being singles opportunity in Japan. Hopefully. Cool. Anybody else? Any other questions there? Yes, sir. Uh, when you mentioned earlier, you did sort of the like training and work with Josh Barnett. Was that more MMA-based training or was that pro wrestling? Because I know he's been doing more pro wrestling nowadays. Yeah, no, you know what? It was all all shooting stuff. Uh, <clears throat> I first met Josh when we were talking earlier about when I was starting to do more independence. I would I would go to a promotion called Pinnacle Wrestling in Seattle, Washington, which is it's only like an hour flight from Calgary. And um, I first met Josh there, and we were working in New Japan at the same time, but uh, they had kind of stopped using him. But he was under one of those contracts where he was getting paid every month no matter what, which was really awesome for him to be getting that. Um, and then I started training with him when I would go to uh, shows in Seattle. And uh, I'll say Pinnacle Wrestling in Seattle was really, it was one of those kind of interesting promotions too, like really not the greatest wrestling there. Some of the guys were pretty lousy and like almost comically bad, but the promotion was always like a good atmosphere and like good people and I always loved going out there. And then they wind up, wound up making me the champion of the company. And then my last, my, actually my very, very last independent wrestling show was 
in Seattle, Washington, and then I dropped the title to uh, I think it was T.J. It was to T.J. Wilson, and then he was kept it up until he got signed to WWE. And it's funny how it works. Uh, it was that weekend I dropped the title to T.J. Wilson in Pinnacle Wrestling, and then the following weekend was my first week with WWE, and I was working Rob Conway in Spokane, Seattle, and Tacoma, Washington. That, like one week later, same week, uh, same same city. So. Funny how that works. Okay. And um, what's it like for you whenever you're Georgia, whenever you're visiting Harry or you're uh, visiting arenas, watching him wrestle, getting to support him, you getting to hook up? Because obviously, I I've just even trying to to, to have a conversation with him is is difficult because it's like one time he's nine hours ahead and then he's five hours behind. And then, like that's 16 hours for him. What, what, what's going on? So, is it nice to be able to hook up with your brother, get to spend a bit of time in different locations and stuff? And yeah, because um, I saw him at Christmas, but then before that, I hadn't seen him for a year, over, over a year. Um, and then I missed him when he did the the World of Sports. Um, but the last match I think I saw him wrestle at was in Calgary at the um, where you got when you won the Stu Hart belt. Yes, that, yeah, that's right. At X-Fest. Um, yeah, but he's pretty good with, like, the time differences and stuff. I mean, he's, he sleeps a lot. He's like a little bear. <laughs> but, like, he's, he's, like, right now... And you I, don't want to see me when I haven't slept. No, I don't want to see the bear. <laughs> like, right now, he's, like, I wouldn't be able to be here if I just flew in from Calgary. I'd be like, lights out. <laughs> but he's, he's, he's pretty good with that. Um, yeah, uh, I... I do enjoy watching him wrestle. It's just like I, I can't be in the audience when I watch him wrestle because I just have like, I always get like an, a stupid wrestling fan beside me that like I get into an argument with because they'll be like, he sucks. And like, I just like, or not even that. Or it'll be like, last time I saw him wrestle in X Fest, Harry had like um, a mosquito bite on his back. And the person was like, hey, pop a zit. Pop that zit. <laughs> and then they started saying stuff like, do him in the ass. And I was like, where is this? Like, and there's like kids around. And I'm like, excuse me, can you not? And he's like, at least I'm having fun. And then I was like, no, you can. I was like, get the fuck out of here. I was like, you idiot. We have those. And if you want, I will, I will give you permission to tell them to get the yeah, fuck out. Yeah, like I told him off. Tomorrow my, evening, just get the fuck out. And like my mom's right there. And he's like, come on, do some anal sex. And, <laughs> and I was like, buddy. Why not? <laughs> like, what? And I was like, where, like, and there's kids. I was like, please, that, don't do that. And my mom's like, oh, my God. And then I told him, I was like, get out of here. And then my mom was like, thank you for doing that. But, like, he was, like, going to get into an argument with me, and his stupid girlfriend was like, honey, just let it be. And I was like, <laughs> oh, God. So, But I always, like, I'm always beside, like, some idiot that I get into, like, an argument with. So, like, I just prefer not to be in the audience because I'll be like, yeah, so... That's that in a nutshell. You just hang backstage and get lots of photographs with lots of famous wrestlers. <laughs> uh, so I got this without putting together posters, and I'm like, oh, this is quite impressive. And actually, you know, she's popped up again. Oh, there she's again. There's Roddy Piper, there's Iron Sheik, and there's a, you know, so it's, it, that must be kind of cool aspect to obviously, whenever you, you're at like the, the conventions and stuff, mm. you're going to hear a lot of stories about your dad and a lot of memories and things. Is that nice when you, you're talking to those older wrestlers and the older generation? For those, for, the, for them to sort of talk about your family in such high regard, and uh, th is that a fun thing? Those memories to hear that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then sometimes, like, they'll tell a story, and they'll be like, "That didn't happen." Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah. Like we saw the Nasty Boys in WrestleCon, and that was interesting. They had lots of good little stories about my dad. Uh, interesting pair of wild boars, Bebop and Rocksteady. And yeah. Those two. They're like a couple of bad wild <laughs> animals. <laughs> Really bad wild animals, too. Um, but yeah, it's always great. And like sometimes, like with Bob Holly, like Harry, you wrestled Bob Holly, Holly was it like what, two years ago now? Here. Yeah, was we it? were just on a convention together, but he knew my dad pretty well. Really, you know, he had some funny stories, some rib stories about uh, my dad and Noah and stuff like that. So, uh, and then another um, wrestler I'm sure everybody in here is familiar with that he didn't get mentioned before, but that I had the opportunity to wrestle with in WWE once, and then after I left onto the independent circuit was Fit Finley. It was yeah, always really, well, really we great. Always great um, 
experience wrestling him. He's world-class professional. And it's just amazing at how he kept in such good shape, for, especially for his age, you know. And, you know, he was just one of those guys that's just solid as a rock. And he's, I really admire his wrestling style. And, you know, everything he does looks believable. And there's a, a principle and there's a meaning behind it. And, you know, he's just one of those guys that's just, you know, I mean, really respectable for the wrestling business. Yeah. Really awesome. So. Very good. It's nice to. He's the man. He's day. awesome. Yeah. yeah. He certainly is the man over in these these parts of the waters. Um, the fans are going to want to know, and maybe you get asked this quite a lot. It's probably probably a cliche question, but the 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 week you released and the the CM Punk promo, oh, yeah. when he mentioned it, they're like, well, "Do you like? Obviously, you've just been released, so you're probably not sitting down watching Raw that week." But uh, <laughs> does that does that get back to you? Does that is that is that a personal nod to say, hey, look, this guy's actually got it, and you shouldn't have done it? Or, or how do you, how do you feel about that? Well, yeah, you know. So when that happened, um, I wasn't watching Raw at the time, and I, w I wasn't I hadn't been watching it for quite a while. I, I still don't really watch it, but that's just because I'm I'm always busy and. It's not. It's because it went to three hours, and there's too much advertising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, if I hear about a good match, I'll like I'll pop up on YouTube and, and yeah. check it out. But I didn't, I had no idea about it. And then all of a sudden, I think I was at the gym or something, and I was, like my phone started erupting with all these texts. I'm going, what, 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 you know? And then I watched it later, and then I sent him a, a, a text and said, you know, thank you very much for that, I guess, sort of like encomium that he, you know, said about me. And, and uh, I, I don't even think he messaged me back, but. He did. No, oh, did he? I can't, I can't even remember. He said, go go fight or something. Yeah, or go, go after them or whatever. And uh, that was kind of the last time I heard from him, so. so. You're just doing your thing now. Killer Elite Squad, obviously Lance is injured. You can support Lance Pro Wrestling Tees, by the way. Go on to Pro Wrestling Tees, buy a t-shirt, make sure some money goes back into his pocket while he's yeah. out injured. That's right. Um, you want to go singles there, Suzuki Gun. How, how yeah, you, I'll look, you know, we were just talking about that. I, uh, I'm wanting to do more grappling tournaments. I just won um, super heavyweight uh, for expert division for Naga in um, Las Vegas last August. And we were just like down the road from, um, there was the Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor rematch. So we, some of the UFC guys came and they were managing a couple guys, grapplers that were on it. So I won the heavyweight championship there and Congratulations. wanting to do more of those when uh, time permits with my schedule and stuff and I'll say competing is like a really really awesome experience because it's one of those things where I was so nervous going into it but you know like you're wrestling in front of like 20,000 fans and stuff like that but you're nervous but you're you're in front of like a totally different crowd because they're like people just kind of watching that don't know you or kind of do know you and 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 then I was of course happy with the outcome because we got the championship so and it was just it's really awesome kind of new experience to compete like in a different kind of way yeah. like that is and there a different thrill different buzz or adrenaline from the competition as you're going in there yeah well you know th like I'll say this like when we were talking earlier when I, about when I won the tag team titles, like, like that kind of feeling when I won the tag team titles, it's the same kind of feeling when you win the grappling championship just because even though it's different because you actually won it, you know, doing... Whereas opposed to that, but the, I guess the kind of the same feeling you get from the crowd, you get that from yourself from winning it, you know what I yeah. mean? And then just getting, like, when you've, you know, I've released on social media right away, of course, and then just getting all the positive feedback and, and stuff like that about it. So it was a really great experience. And, well, and in, you know, competing, even if it's a win or if it's a loss, you always, you learn something from it. And, like, one thing I'll say about competing is, like, I guess training and stuff like that, there's a difference between swimming on the mats and swimming on the water, you know what I mean? And when you're actually on live time against a guy that you have no idea, you know he's good, but you don't know if he's judo background, jiu-jitsu background, wrestling background, 
and you shake hands and okay, we're on, you know, yeah. and you got to feel it. So it was, it was a really awesome experience. I recommend anybody that has kids to, you know, try grappling, try sending them to jujitsu schools if they want to do that too. And yeah. you know what I mean? And it just, and after you compete too, so, you know, like, it can add up to being like six months worth of training because after you're done that, you really know, okay, I need to work on this because this didn't work or this guy was really good at that. So you're like focused on really trying to get better at that certain thing. Yeah. And different people are good at different things. It's, it's kind of like, like, you be pro, like if you and I pro wrestle each other. I would win. I, I would win. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we pro wrestle each other, you know, 100 times here in, in Belfast, We'll get good, but say, for instance, if you leave and you wrestle with somebody, you know, like, say, in Dublin, that you, or, or no, let's say, in Bel or Belgium, you know what I mean? Maybe you'll pick up something, yeah. or, you know what I mean, get a different experience. So it's, it was a really awesome thing as far as that goes, too. Awesome. And then that goes with your time, Dave Batista's gym as well. Are you still yes. working there? Or? Well, no, because I, I don't live in Tampa anymore. Like, I still have a condo there that I've rented out, but... I actually, and I'll say this, like not to sound full of myself, but I really helped Dave Batista in, in his, leading up to his pro MMA debut with the training. And the training at his gym was a really awesome experience. I mean, he brought in Stefan Bonner, um, uh, Justin McCullough, uh, Eric Albarassin as, as coaches for that. So getting to learn from guys that are like on the, that were on the pro UFC level was a really awesome experience, and <clears throat> I would say out of all the people, I probably sparred with him the most leading up to that fight because I'm a big guy, and my wrestling is, I would say, pretty pretty high level, and I got to, and it would, which was really awesome was because Dave landed a, a good takedown and then won by, by a ground and pound, but, and, and Dave being a little bit, you know, he was 42 when he had his first MMA debut. He had no real wrestling background, so for him to do that and pick up wrestling that fast is a is a is a pretty good thing to say. I mean, you know, it was it was really good, and his striking, Dave's striking, his leg kicks. I think I still have some nerve damage in my one leg from his leg kicks. He kicks really hard, and I don't know why in his in his MMA fight, it didn't show at all. Like I think he was just so nervous, and that's part of the thing is like sometimes competing and doing stuff like that for the first time, you don't really show what you can do because you're so tight and nervous, but he, yeah. his actually, his striking was his, his, his asset and it didn't show, but his wrestling takedown, thanks to myself and Stefan Bonner and other guys helping train him, uh, you know, he, he did that good and he won against the pro fighters, so, and uh, Dave's a great guy, he's one of those guys, he'd give you the shirt off his back or whenever we go out to eat, he'd always pay for the meal, he's, Super awesome guy. He always let me train at his gym, you know, so I haven't heard from him for a little while because he's been busy with his movie stuff, but yeah. I hope he's doing good. Awesome. And uh, do we have any other audience questions? Oh. Do you have any grappling matches coming up? Like we were saying earlier, because you have more things I got now. There was yep. the Annie Bravo promotions and Athletic Man of Yeah, you know what? I don't have anything as far as coming, like, uh, I'm looking into doing more. I have another, um, I have a couple catch wrestling victories over uh, Travis Nawaza, who's uh, Eddie Bravo, 10th Planets. Uh, I think he's a, he won Gracie Nationals in the Brown Belt Division, actually. At, um, so he, he was an awesome grappler, and I was, I mean, having two catch wrestling victories, and the, in t the catch wrestling rules is 10 minutes, and it's anything goes pretty much so. And Eddie Bravo is an awesome grappler himself. I mean, the twister and everything. Uh, I don't have anything coming up. I'm always looking to do more. Um, you know, I don't know what my upcoming schedule with Japan, what that's like. But as long as I can prepare for it and do some training, like say, for instance, with someone like Josh Barnett, always when I train with that guy, I come away like a much better fighter or much, I guess, or athlete or or competitor. And leading up to the Naga that I won last summer, I was training with him quite a bit. And 
Josh is one of those guys, he's a really, really, I guess how you say, like a cerebral, he's a very smart fighter. He really knows what you need to do to win, especially like game plans for fights. And he knows usually what he needs to do to, to win a guy, and that's why, or not cerebral assassin, but he's, he's very good at picking out people's weak points, what you need to do to get better, what we're gonna do in practice to get there. I mean, and his, and Josh is one of those guys, a lot of pro fighters don't like to train with him because he rolls hard and he will rip off your ankle, if you, know, you know what I mean? And people d don't like to train with him because he, he rolls that hard and he, you know, sometimes will tell people what they don't wanna hear and that's just the way that he is. But he, as far as a fighter goes, he's awesome. As far as a coach goes, he's really awesome. I don't know if you could say that he's better as a coach, but he's really awesome in both fields. And he has the will to win, you know what I mean? And he's got that, he always has like a game plan of what we need to do, what we need to work on. You know, this, you really allows you to, this escape. So you know what, for after we're done training and stuff like that, for, 30 minutes, you're on your back and you're working on a side position, you know what I mean? <laughs> but when you come out of that camp, you're phew, light years better. And actually, I'll say this, Brock Lesnar would train under Eric Paulson, who was Josh Barnett's coach, but he wouldn't come to Los Angeles to train with Josh Barnett. And I'm not gonna say that Brock's scared of Josh or anything like that, but <laughs> I don't think that he wanted to get beat up or possibly hurt in the training room because Josh is known to hurt people sometimes in the training room. And Josh, Josh actually said Brock should come and train with me because I think he has a lot of great skills. I think I could make him a better fighter, but he needs to work on this, this, and this, and this. And it never happened, but you know, and he thought that he could bring out a lot of potential in Brock. And actually since Bobby Lashley has started coming and working with Josh Barnett, I mean, he's been winning, he's won his last few fights. He won a, got a rear naked choke, he got another submission, and he's looking really good. So that's just to say what Josh can do with fighters. So the proof's in the pudding. There you go. Anybody else right there is anything else? We've got uh, one more. Past or present, is there something that you really always wanted to work with? Oh yeah, I mean in the past, Jesus. I mean my uncle Brad, uh, my dad. <clears throat> um, you tagged with your dad, Chris Benoit. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did actually get to, to tag wow. up with him. Uh, present, actually, yes, I do. I have a few. Um, Masakatsu Funaki, who wrestles for All Japan Pro Wrestling, and Jun Akiyama, who wrestles for All Japan Pro Wrestling as well. Unfortunately, I'm not in that company, but I mean, not to say that that's. A bad thing, and New Japan's the number one, and I'm happy there. But there are two competitors that I think are really awesome. Jun is one of those guys that's still around, and he, he was still, he was like in the original All Japan with like, you know, Mizawa, Kabashi, Kawada, Tawe, that sort of, that group. And he's still going, and he's still having awesome matches, you know what I mean? So I think that there would be a lot that I could learn from. Uh, with someone like him. And Masakatsu Funaki, I mean, geez, he was wrestling even with my Uncle Owen back in New Japan in eight, 1988. He went off, went into uh, Fujiwara Gumi, then went into Pancras, and you know, and, and he w came back to pro wrestling, and guy's in great shape, he's still going, he's doing good, I really respect Funaki, so. Those are two guys that nowadays that I would really like to wrestle. And you know, there's other guys like I mentioned before, like Shibata, that are that are, are going now that are, I mean, I really like their strong style. They, you know, they kick ass, they're good, you know, and they'll take it too, so. And um, George, I have, a, I have a very important question for you because now you've met the, the man that makes it all happen, Terry Thompson. Mm -hmm. Who's better looking, Vince or Terry? Vincent, oh, Terry. Terry, there we go, there we go. He'll be very, he'll be, he'll be very pleased to hear that sitting back there. Um, that's pretty much all we've really got time for this evening. Thank you very much for coming out. Um, unless you've got any last tidbits that you want to release, or special funny stories, or 
We've got three. You know what? We many. we do, but there's too many who <laughs> might be here all night. But uh, tenth anniversary. No, yeah, yeah. We'll save it for next. <laughs> time. Yeah. No worries, um, Georgia, Harry. I just like to thank you personally for coming along to Pro Wrestling Ulster, doing this uh, event for us tonight, just to kick off the t- tenth anniversary uh, special events. It will, of course, be going out via our on-demand service, and there may even be a podcast of this available for download as well. So uh, thank you for coming out this evening. Um, give you, uh, just thank give, you, everybody. Yes. Thank you. The Belfast fans, give you a round of applause. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be coming to the Europa Hotel tomorrow evening for New Direction, of course. TV Boy Smith Jr. is going to be there. Georgia Smith is coming along for a bit of fun. I'll be watching, yep. All the announcements have been made, so uh, I don't think there's anything else coming out. The Facebook people will tell you. I don't know who's doing that at the moment, but uh, we all know it's going to be a new direction tomorrow evening. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing this man wrestle at the Europa Hotel tomorrow evening in the Grand Ballroom. Thank you very much, and good night, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Belfast. Thank you. I got the...